So when do we have control and when do we have to capitalize? Let's have a look. We have these two types of leases and how we've defined it is pretty much, we've defined a finance lease as a particular thing and then an operating lease is just everything else. So it's not here's finance lease, here's an operating lease and they're defined as unique things because that would allow types of leases to fall within the cracks. It's pretty much anything which is not a finance lease is just going to be an operating lease. But what a finance lease is, is a lease that transfers substantially all the risks and rewards incidental to ownership of an asset. At the end of that, you may or may not end up with ownership. But the critical thing is that idea of risks and risk and rewards of ownership have been transferred. You have basically got control of that asset. And when we look at paragraph 10, they give us a whole range of things which suggest a finance lease. Now, there's an important overriding point to this. And I have a feeling that uh, maybe a few people in the room have seen it, maybe a few people haven't. Have many of you guys seen the movie The Castle? Got one, a couple, a few people going, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. I could sit down and show you, I mean, if it, there's a clip in it, there's a section in it when they're discussing the Constitution, they're sort of saying, you know, which section of the Constitution, you know, sort of is at issue here, and, and it's the vibe of the thing. That's what we're looking at with this, is just, just does this lease seem like a finance lease? Does this feel like there is a transfer of the risks and, risk and rewards? It's not, yes, we tick off all these things and that's absolutely the case. I mean, if you do tick them all off, yeah, it probably is. But you're getting this holistic idea of have you basically got control of this thing? That's what you're looking for. If you're going to get ownership at the end of it, it's probably a pretty good idea that you do. It's not certain, for example, but it's probably pretty good. If you don't get ownership at the end, it doesn't mean that it's not. If you have an option to buy an asset less than its fair value, again, it, you probably do have a finance lease, but just because that option doesn't exist doesn't mean it's not. The next two points that also bring up a very important other aspect of, standard, of the international standards, which is what Australian standards are based on, is international standards, so the Australian standards, are seen as a principles-based set of standards. Whereas when you look at the major kind of competitor group of standards, which is US GAAP, is seen much more as a rules-based set of standards. And so what we're talking about there is, look at that third dot point. Lease term is for the major part of an asset's life. So if I tell you the asset's life is 10 years, what is the major part? Yeah, so anything above five years? Because, you know, 5.1 years is greater than 4.9, so that seems to be the major bit. Someone else could say nine years, someone else could say six. It's not specifically defined. Whereas in the US with US GAAP, they actually give you a bright line rule and say this is what we define as a thing, that, a threshold they have to cross. And they will actually give you a percentage. Um, without wanting to color color what that percentage is in your guys' perceptions of it. There is a percentage which exists and you'll often find a lot of leases fall just under that. So, you know, if it's X percent, it'll be like X minus 1% leases coming at the use of life. So it doesn't tick over that threshold. That's the sort of structuring we start to see if you have rules-based systems. Kind of like Richard's earlier comment about turn it in. We don't have a bright line rule. It's not like anything above 20% we will absolutely look at. It's just We'll have a look. We'll just sort of see how everything works out, and just based on how many come, you know, how many come in a certain way, how much time we have to do it, and how lazy we're feeling. Yeah, I mean, that's okay. That's been a bit flippant, but we don't have a bright line to that. It's just we'll have a general sense of it. We've got an idea about how it works, and then we'll sort of make a professional judgment because we've been doing this for a while as to what we want to have a look at. It doesn't necessarily help you in the sense that can I just work that number down? So okay, I've got it down to 19%. Sweet, don't have to worry about it. That 19% could be an issue for us. Um, probably, like I doubt it will be, but I'm not saying yours is at 20% or 19%, but that's this idea of using professional judgment. 
And whilst we have professional judgment in the standards, I still have a job and you guys have jobs, at least you go to, because if everything was just automatically set up and just inputs and just throw it all out of the system, we'd just be run by computers. Because we have professional judgments in there, there will be jobs to go to. Um, same deal with present value of minimum lease payments. What is, what's the difference between major part and substantially all? Now, substantially all sounds more than major part. But again, like what, we don't have a percentage of it. Now, again, the US actually do have a percentage. And again, I'm not going to tell you what it is because otherwise you'll then just go, that should be the percentage we use here. Um, but that's, that is, again, another professional judgment. Um, if the lease assets are specialized, that's suggestive that it is a finance lease. So for initial measurement, so when you start, when you enter into this contract, at the commencement of the lease term, this is for a finance lease. We'll look at operating leases in a second. And this is also for, and I, sorry, I didn't make mention of this, this is for the lessee. So this is for the party getting use of the asset. So for that party at the commencement of the lease term, the lessee shall recognize finance leases as assets and liabilities. We're showing an asset on the books, we're showing a liability on the books. At amounts equal to the fair value of the lease property, We've talked about fair value ad nauseum throughout the semester so that we should have a fair indication of what that is. Or we're comparing it to another number, the present value of the minimum lease payments. We'll talk about that next slide. Get those two numbers, take the lower one, and that is the number that you use as the asset and the liability. For the present valuing, we use the rate implicit and we will provide you that discount rate. Um, what else do we need to do there? If we have any initial direct cost of the lessee, we add that to the asset only. And that makes sense because think about what is an asset versus what is a liability. The liability is the amount that you're paying for this particular thing. So if I'm leasing it from you guys, my liability is the money that I owe to you guys. And if I've spent money setting this asset up in another way, I'm not adding that to the liability in relation to the lease. Um, but if I've had to incur some costs in relation to that lease to get it set up, I will add that to the cost of the asset because that's what we do with assets. We, we do it with property, plant, and equipment. We do it with inventory. We do it with intangible assets. All those costs that are directly attributable to getting that asset to where we want to use it get fed in here. And that's what we're doing. Now, all of that would be a completely redundant point if this last paragraph we see here wasn't there. If companies could set off their lease assets and lease liabilities, they'd have a $100 million asset, they'd have a $100 million liability, they'd net them out and show nothing. So you need to actually explicitly say we don't have a set off because that means you have to show the asset and you have to show the liability. Um, so that's a really important paragraph sitting in there. <clears throat> right, so what are, present, what are the present value of minimum lease payments? These are things you've got to pay. So I pay rent on a, mine's a bit of a funny situation, but I pay rent on a monthly basis. I actually pay my rent in arrears, which is not usual. Normally you pay rent in advance. Um, but that's important for when you guys are doing the calculations for this. Make sure you're aware of the timings because we're looking at the cash flow timing. So if it's in advance, you know, figure out it's going to be time zero payment, time one, time two, time three. If it's, in a, if it's in arrears, it's going to be time one, time two, time three, time four. Um, so let's, for argument's sake, I'm going to use my real rental rate. Let's say I'm paying $200, $200 a month in rent, which is obviously a pretty good deal in Sydney. Um, 200 bucks a month in rent, that is my regular payment. So that is the regular periodic payments that we're talking about. A guaranteed residual is not something that you will see generally. You can never say never, but I would dare say you'll never see this on a rental property. But you'll often see this with car leases. And if you look in the financial papers and you know, you'll see the fancy, fancy cars, sort of the Audis and the Range Rovers and the BMWs, they have like, you know, you know, own the, you know, own a BMW or get this BMW for like, you know, 200 bucks a month. And when you look at the fine print, it'll be 200 bucks a month for 36 months with like a $5,000 upfront payment and a balloon payment of 50% of the value of the car. 
So that is actually that guaranteed residual that they're paying. So you're paying a, a big amount of money right at the end. Now that large amount of money at the end is basically you saying, if I want to keep this asset, I'm going to give you that $20,000 at the end and I get to walk away with the asset. If I don't want the asset anymore at the end, I will return it. If that asset is worth at least $20,000 at the end, then we're all square and we can all walk away. If the asset is worth, if you've trashed that car and the asset is worth $5,000, you're going to have to make up the difference. And that's why it's a guaranteed residual because you're giving up at least $20,000 at the end there. So it's part of an outflow. So think about this from a liability perspective. If you've got these payments fit, like if these payments are part of what you've got to do, those are things which you're going to be paying. If you're looking at the guaranteed residual, that is something that you're going to be paying. So it is an outflow from the business. This last one, bargain purchase, bargain purchase option, we don't include an unguaranteed residual and we'll talk about that when we talk about lessors. It makes a lot more sense then. But a bargain purchase option. For those that are doing ABC, when you have a consolidation, when you have a, an associate sitting there, what is a situation when you have a bargain purchase? What, that, what is actually happening then? Yeah, so when you have a bargain purchase and when you have a gain on bargain purchase, you have paid less for that company than what that company is worth. You have got, funnily enough, a bargain, which is why it's called that. Now, a bargain purchase option, being an option, doesn't mean you have to exercise it. So there's no, it's not saying that you're going to actually use it. So the question then is, why do we include an option in the payments that you cannot avoid? Now, there's been an assumption made here, and I'm going to actually test you guys on this. I hope it's on the next slide. Hey, there we go. So, anyone who knows cars, anyone know what car that is? R8. That was quick off the draw. Yeah, it is. It's an Audi R8. They're not cheap cars. Um, new, they're about 250 I think. I'm looking at you because you're quick yeah. off. Around half a mil. Around half a mil now. I thought they're about 250 I don't think so. No, well, maybe I'm thinking in pounds. Um, they're expensive cars nonetheless. So, imagine you guys, imagine. If I was this wealthy, I wouldn't obviously be here. But imagine I was that wealthy. I was able to lease out an R8 to every single one of you here. So you've been using this car for three years. At the end of that, I've given you the option. Let's say the fair value at the end of three years of that R8 is about 250. So maybe the new it's up to half a mil. Degrades in value real quickly. Let's say it's about $250,000 is what the fair value of a three-year-old R8 is. So you're all sitting there. You've got these real fancy cars. I've included in that an option for you to purchase that car off me for $100,000. Now, you may not necessarily like cars. You may prefer a BMW, you may prefer a bicycle, you may prefer public transport. You may not have a driver's license. Would you buy that car from me? I don't know, would you? Fair value at the end of three years. So we're now at three years' time. That car is on the market. With, you could buy that car on the market for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, or you could buy it from me as part of this option for a hundred. Would you buy it from me? It's above board. It's not stolen. It's not anything like that. It's a legitimate car. Would you buy it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's a bloody good deal. Of course you'd buy it from me. Um, it's not falling off the. It's not sort of falling off the back of a truck. It's a legitimately good deal. If you, wanted to, if you actually wanted the car, it's a really good deal. You've saved $150,000 on the car. What would you do if you didn't want the car? Sell it. Yeah, you'd sell it. There's a, there's a market for it. There's a fair value for it. You flog it off. So the assumption is with a bargain purchase option, even if you don't want the asset at the end of it, you will buy it because you can sell it on later. So it is assumed that if you have the opportunity to buy the asset for less than its market price, you will exercise that option. And I think that is fairly rational human behavior. Even if you didn't have the money up front now, I'm pretty sure you could pre-sell it to someone else and figure out a way to make it happen. I am damn sure you would find a way. So how we measure this financially subsequently? We now have an asset on the balance sheet. We now have a liability on the balance sheet. If you have financed this purchase of a car through some sort of lease arrangement, you are going to have interest. 
So as you're paying this back, you've got to figure out what is the interest cost of the money that we've borrowed. It is a liability, it has cost to you. All of this is saying the minimum lease payment. So each time you are paying back the monthly repayment or the yearly repayment or however regular the repayment is, that gets split between how much is the interest component and how much you are paying to knock off the liability. If you look at home loan calculators for a principal and interest loan, that is exactly what happens. You will pay back your monthly repayment and that will be split between paying off the interest on the loan and then knocking down the liability. That's what we're talking about. And that's actually what we did last week when we looked at the lease or the liability amortization. We're gonna be doing the same thing. The finance charge should be allocated to each period during the lease term as to produce a constant periodic rate of interest on the remaining balance of the liability. It is effectively the effective interest method. So it is what we did last week, it's what we did in week six. Before we get to the next slide, if you have property, plant and equipment, how do we measure it subsequently? What is something that happens with property, plant and equipment? We, we have revaluations for property, plant and equipment. We don't have revaluations for leased assets. What is the other thing which happens with property, plant and equipment? We have depreciation. That does happen. So we need to look at depreciation. And what is the other thing we have happen with property, plant and equipment? We've talked about revaluations. We've talked about depreciation. And there is impairments. We have impairments for leased assets and we have depreciation for leased assets. We don't have revaluations. And so you've already figured out the next slide. And if you we're getting the answers to the next slide, well, you've already step ahead. Leased assets can also be impaired. Leased assets, finance leases also give us a depreciation expense. The only issue that we have is the lease term and the useful life may be different. So the question for you guys is just which time do you use? If you've leased it for five years and the, and the useful life is eight, the thing that you're worried about is are you going to keep the asset after, you, after the lease term finishes? So if you intend, it doesn't actually have to be like this, if you intend to give it back, you use the shorter period of time because that's the length of time you're going to have it. So you use five years. If you intend to keep it, you use eight because that's the length of time you're going to use it. So it's just literally how long you're going to use it for is what, you, what you'd appreciate it over. But other than that, depreciation works pretty much the same. All right. And on that note, let's have a look at the first example.